is. Follow him, follow Jesus, and experience the extraordinary. And I was looking at Ephesians 5, 16, and it tells us that we live in evil days. Now, that was written 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And Paul said these are evil days. And guess what? They still are, and they always have been. And so I don't know if it's more evil now than it was then, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. I saw that slide you had up here Wednesday night about uh, uh, the people who were waiting to be martyred for their faith with the lions ready, waiting to attack them. We're not quite there yet, praise God. (laughs) And you know what I was thinking as we sang the song, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Guess what? That's us now. Amen. He who is all those things now is in us, and he calls us those things. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news. And so Ephesians 5.16 then goes on to say that spend your life for his purposes. We're in evil times. So what are you going to do? Bemoan the fact that it's an evil time? Lock yourself in your house and stay away from all evil so that you don't get tainted? He said, live your life for my purposes. And I was thinking about this time that we're in and how we have been taught to fear during this time. I think it's one of the main reasons why whoever is, is uh, spreading the information about what's in our world, they want us to fear, and they want us to wear masks, which is fine for those who are compromised, your immunity system is compromised, immune system is compromised, whatever, and you need to wear a mask. But I'll tell you what, I self isolated for three months when this all started, you know, trying to help out and people telling me I'd be selfish if I didn't and so forth. And then when it kept increasing, well, now it'll be another month. Oh, maybe it'll be another year and maybe this is our new normal. And I said, no way. This is not the new normal. I refuse it and besides, I gathered my family then on Memorial Day, and I said, I am done volunteering. I'm done with volunteering for this, my self-isolation. This is my coming out party. And I had a barbecue for them, and I said, and there were around 20 family members, and I said, now we're going to hold hands. And we're going to come against this antichrist spirit that doesn't want us to lay hands on the sick. We also sang the song, his very breath. He gives us our breath. It's his breath we're giving forth. (laughs) His breath coming forth from me. And there's power in the spirit of God coming forth from us. So we're living for his purposes still. By the way, all I had this morning was Eric's wonderful hand-roasted, bean-by-bean, <laughs> ground, bean-by-bean coffee. <laughs> I think it dries up your mouth. Yeah, so. <laughs> so we want to live for his purposes on this earth because we're doing kingdom business. The kingdom of God is, as it says in the Gospels, it says it's near, it's at hand. But everything changed when Jesus went to the cross. You know, he did something when he died for us and rose from the dead. He accomplished a lot because he said, it is finished. He accomplished what needed to be accomplished to give us abundant life on this earth. And he said, now it's our turn to spread that to other people. But he said, now the kingdom of God is in you. 
And first Colossians, first Colossians, not first Colossians, Colossians 1, somewhere there in Colossians 1, it said, you have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. That's where we live now because the kingdom is in us. When Jesus rose from the dead, the day of Pentecost, he said, I'm going to my father and I'm sending a comforter and he's going to come and he's going to fill you and give you life abundant. And that happened and the kingdom of God came within us. And it says in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost, righteousness. We have been made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for you so that you might become the righteousness of God in him. Peace, the kingdom of God in us is righteousness, it's peace. What kind of peace? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We now have peace with God. You don't have to worry about whether or not God loves you, whether or not he is at peace with you, because it says he is. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we get these foundations, if we get the truth of our identity, then we can fulfill his purpose. Otherwise, you're always going to be saying, what's the will of God for me? And it's to be here knowing that the kingdom is in you and that you have purpose to spread that kingdom throughout the world. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news, preach the gospel. Not just when it's good times, not just when it's peaceful times on the earth, but when it's evil times. Mm -hmm. Occupy. Occupy means do something. (laughs) Don't just occupy a chair in your family room and watch TV. That is not occupying the way that he wants us to occupy by fulfilling our purpose on this earth. And it's our purpose, basically, is just to be a blessing to others. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And how has God blessed us? And Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, so that we can be a blessing. So I had this friend. Well, we are the church. We are his body. We are the kingdom of God because the king reigns inside of us and he reigns forever and ever. And I was thinking during the night, Eric got, he asked, everyone says, well, how was your night? And the first few nights it was good, but then it was coming time for me to speak, like Friday night, and it wasn't so good. And he said, oh, it's that before you speak night. And and that's how last night was. Plus, I stubbed my toe when I got up. (laughs) But, thinking about the Lord's Prayer during the night. Okay, let's go through this a little. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said to his disciples to pray that, and that was before the cross. Guess what? Now his kingdom has come. His will is being done through us. As it is in heaven, our job is to bring heaven to earth. What we know is going on in heaven, we pass on to others here on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And and to, is this a part of it? Uh, To thine be the glory and the power and the, what else is that word? And the kingdom, yeah. The kingdom forever and ever. That's inside of us. Jesus now reigns inside of us. Remember that. You don't have to focus on yourself anymore. You focus on the greater one who lives inside of you. And, and you know, I used to have friends, and 
They were always dying to something. They took that scripture that says, I die daily, and I would, I would say, I would think to myself, just die and get it over with. <laughs> <laughs> because there was always something new every day. Oh, I'm going to have to die to this. I have to <laughs> die to that. It's not what it means. Paul was saying that because he faced death every day. People who wanted to kill him, they were always trying. They did a few times, and he was resurrected. He was stoned. And I was in Kenya one time when they were still stoning people. I don't know if they do today. But in the paper was a picture of them getting ready to stone a person. These were boulders that they would stand around a pit, and the intended was down there, and they would throw, throw boulders. So it's not just little pebbles, you naughty boy. No. <laughs> it was meant to kill. But, and that's what Paul faced. And thank God we're not facing that either in this evil day, in this time that we're going through. So I, I told my family we are holding hands. And they probably hadn't touched anyone for weeks. We're holding hands and we are praying together as a family. And we are going to lay hands on the sick when he wants us to. We're going to hug people when he wants us to. So that's my little speech about that. But here we are. Uh, we're citizens of heaven. It's a new kingdom in us. And I had posted something on Facebook, and my friend whom Paul knows, Amy Coulter, she wrote to me and she said, um, I was reading through the comments on your page. Oh, I know when it was, September 4th, when my husband passed five years. And I put a picture of us, and that was on Easter after we were married. It wasn't our wedding day, that picture. And uh, I had a, a story there about a friend of his who had said some words to me that were not good, and that's in the new newsletter. And um, anyway, so many people posted how they missed my husband because he had such life in him and that uh, he, they were so blessed by him. And this is five years after he's been in heaven. And like there were four, over 400 people who were saying things and writing things about him. And she said, you've touched so many lives. What a blessing to be a blessing. Do you feel like you've changed the world? That's what Amy asked me. And I wrote back to her and I said, yes, absolutely. We change the world everywhere we go because Jesus lives his life on this earth through us as us. So, of course, that's what you're doing. That's the will of God for you, to be his life on this earth, to show people who he is, to show people his goodness. Do you know that in the Old Testament, Moses said to God, show me your glory. And what did God do? He showed Moses his goodness. So glory is his goodness. And that's why we show people God's goodness, because Romans 4, Romans 2, 4 says, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And what is repentance? It's changing your mind and believing God's goodness. It's not about your sin. It's about believing God's goodness, believing what he did for you. So if you can stop focusing on yourself and stop focusing on your sin and just let God live his life through you, you won't think about sinning. It just won't come to your mind. I never think, well, today I'm going to do this sin. <laughs> I never think that. <laughs> I just get up and I say, God, you're so good. I thank you so much for how wonderful you are. And I'm just going to live my life letting you live through me. I think I've told you this story before, but 
I was sitting, I was communing with God and Jesus, and I, I saw myself sitting on a park bench with him, and he was looking in my eyes, and his eyes were pools of love as he looked into my eyes. He didn't say a thing about sin, by the way. And he said, I said to him, as I looked in his eyes, it's in you that I live and move and have my very being. And that's from Acts, by the way. Paul said that. He looked back at me with those eyes of love, and he said to me, and it's in you that I live and move and have my very being. And that changed my life. And I go by that today. And that's what I think of every day, even if I stay home and watch TV or do a puzzle or something like that. It's okay. It's okay with him. I don't feel guilty. I don't feel like it's a sin if I'm not out on the streets. But here's another thing. Go into all the world. Do you know that the USA is part of the world? Let me tell you. Surprise! (laughs) Do you know that your neighborhood is part of the world? Whoa! (laughs) You've got a mission field right where you are. Do you know even your marriage may be a mission field? Let me tell you, my first daughter married a man who had been divorced and remarried twice before. He brought these young adult children with him, and uh, there were reasons why he'd been married and divorced several times before. (laughs) And so she called me on the phone one day, and she said, Mom, I have married Peyton Place. I've married a soap opera. And I said, Tamara, you have married your mission field. And she took those words to heart, and oh my goodness, she has transformed the family dynamics. And the ones who were in prison wrote to her and thanked her for being a mother figure to them. She was 20 years younger, but she was willing to do that, to let God show himself strong through her to this family. And now I've got uh, great-great-grandchildren from that part of the family. Because when she brought those children, those, they were adults. When she brought them in, they became my grandchildren. And then their children, however they got here, became my great-grandchildren. And theirs, however they got here, became my great-grandchildren. Great-great, yes, great-great. So, got two great-greats, beautiful children, and I love them. But that's our mission field. So, uh, then I went on to say to Amy, Jesus himself is bringing heaven to earth through you, dearest Amy. She was running at the time for state senator, no, for U.S. senator in the uh, state of Maine which is very bold. (laughs) And so uh, I just said, you are bringing heaven to earth through you. And I also wrote this, I believe it is the meaning of humility to believe what God says about you. Yeah, believe what he says about you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Believe what he says about you. And what does he say about you now since Jesus did what he did? So we are not defined by our past. What happened to you in life? Oh, you poor thing. Your mother wanted to abort you, and and you just felt so out of place. Well, I can say that, but that doesn't define me. Only God defines me and what he has me on this earth for. That's what defines me. You're created in his image, and he enjoys living his life as you, through you, on this earth. 
He enjoys it. That's so much fun. Like if you like to um, surf or do rollerblading or skateboarding or whatever, he's right there enjoying that with you. <laughs> and you have opportunities with that culture of people, that group of people, to be a shining bright light. It's your mission field. So it's not about rules, but relationship with our Father God. And the big buzzword today is influencers, especially if you're on Instagram. You want to be an influencer, and for them it means you're going to sell product and get money. And my goodness, you can make scads of money that way. So think about being an influencer and selling products. But I think that we should all be influencers in whatever our field is in life. Whatever profession we are in, we should be influencers. And I, I wrote this, get on with the joyful business of living the Father's dream, what you were made for. That's his dream for you. So, oh, Roxanne, I can see what you're doing, and it's so wonderful, and I'm right there with you living my life through you as you do that. And uh, as I said to Joy the other night, he just loves living his life through her on this earth. And if you get that in you, it makes life so much more fulfilling. Amen. You're not always navel-gazing. <laughs> so, yes. All right, Philippians 3.12. And I read from the Passion Translation, and all of these scriptures are from the Passion Translation. You know why? Because I like it the best. <laughs> because it gives me passion. Every time I read it, I say, oh my goodness, thank you, God, you're so wonderful. So, by the way, I don't see a clock anywhere, and how am I to know when it's time? Do you do? I bet it's, it's buzzers that go off and, <laughs> and electric ones. <laughs> oh, I know, it's through the microphone. I'll start being zapped. <laughs> so, in Philippians 3, 12, I admit, Paul said, that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance. He's not a miserly God. Yeah, that's really good. And that book that you mentioned, More Than Enough, it's all about finances. Mm. He has more than enough for everyone on this earth. Yeah. Just like there's more than enough water. It keeps coming forth from the ground. He replenishes everything. Think about that. Yes, we should be good stewards, of what we use on this earth, but I hate those paper straws. I had one last <laughs> night. Two sips and you're done. <laughs> run, one, run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. And it's kingdom business, showing his goodness to people. I'm in a neighborhood Bible study, and it's really fun because they're all from a Baptist-type background, and so they'll make statements, and I'll say, well, think about this, and then throw in something that's filled with grace and God's goodness and his love, and oh, I never thought of that, they say. <laughs> It's, it's so fun to do that. It really is. Be an influencer in all realms of life. And God gives us what's necessary to accomplish what he's called you to do. He gives you what's necessary. He's placed us in a body together. He's given us gifts to function within this body. The gifts are all listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and some in Romans 12 and... Uh, there's one, oh, Ephesians 4. 
where gifts are listed that he gives to people and he gives grace to everyone to operate in the gifts that he gives you. And so you have to trust the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and do you know, that's my thing now when I'm starting to get, ah, I don't know if I can do this. I, I don't think I have anything to say. And they've heard it all before, those kinds of words. Have you ever heard those kinds of words? And now I say, but, Holy Spirit, I'm going to trust you. Amen. I'm going to trust you. You got this. Yeah. And he does. He does. If he called you to speak publicly, he's got you. He's going to make it happen Amen. and flow through you. So we're bringing heaven to earth. And have this confidence. Filter everything through the cross and what Jesus did. There are so many movements and Christians that say things on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and I think, don't they know that Jesus died and that he rose again and that he accomplished something when he did that? It's like they have to accomplish it all over, all over again. Why not just bask in the love that God has for you and say, thank you, God, you did it all. My performance isn't going to add anything to what you did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And therefore, I can have a love relationship with God and, and with his son, Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit, and just say, well, whatever you want, I'm here for you, and uh, let's, <coughs> let's see what's next, Papa, it says in Romans 8. What's next, Papa? That's in the message, though. But um, you wake up every day with an expectant. What's next, Papa? So we are constantly looking for the good in God and not focusing on problems. We're living as free people. Yeah. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free for the very purpose of us being free. Wow, glory to God. You can raise your hand, you can twirl, you can do whatever you want to show your love for God and for people. And you can look people in the eyes and just say, God loves you so much and I love you too. And you can mean it. And you don't have to shy away from anyone. You can go to your neighbors and tell them about the goodness of God. If God is for you, nothing can stand against you. So this scripture then, in Colossians 1, 21 to 22, even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, how many have been there? <laughs> you just lived in the shadows and your mind was in control, those thoughts, and, and they caused actions. He reconnected you back to himself. This is what Jesus did. He released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as the sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. Amen. And when do we do that? When we get to heaven? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Don't rejoice here, though, because it's bad. It's <laughs> horrible, evil times. No, it's for now. We are living yeah, in his amen, presence. Amen. He's living in us. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay, so, so we could dwell in his presence. And now there is nothing between you and Father God. Ah, nothing. For he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. That's how God sees us. And it's not because of you and your performance, but it's because of the performance of Jesus. Amen. That God sees us through Jesus as holy. He's made that provision for us. Flawless. Flawless. You made me worthy. No, that's not the song, but you can you can make up those words when you see them in, when you can see them in the Bible, restored. 
if you continue to advance in faith, and sometimes I've heard uh, translators say that it made sense you continue. When it's saying if, it's since you continue, but hey, whatever. Um, in never be shaken from the hope of the gospel you have believed in. And this is the glorious news I preach all over the world, Paul said. That's what he preached. That's why he could say, be cheerful in all situations. We live in perverse and crooked culture. Be cheerful. Because he knew who he was and what Jesus had done for him. So, have you seen The Chosen? It's an app. Have you seen The Chosen? It is so wonderful. And the second season will be coming out soon. It's a crowdfunded app, but it's Jesus. The first season, I think it's eight hours of it, that uh, he's choosing his disciples. And it's so beautiful how Jesus is portrayed. And I love it when he goes to Matthew. And Matthew is a tax collector. And he's, he's just sort of a nerdy type person. And he just doesn't fit in. And Peter went to Jesus and said, Jesus, what are you doing? You can't choose him. He's so different. And Jesus said to Peter, get used to different. Get used to different, yeah. You've got to see it. This is a free app. You just plug in your phone, The Chosen, and get this app downloaded for free. You can pay ahead, and people will write you from around the world. Thank you for that, but you don't have to. And watch that. Watch that with your family. Let them see a picture of Jesus as a human son of God here on this earth. So, follow him and experience the extraordinary then. You can do that once you've settled all these things and you know who you are. So a few of the things that I've experienced in this manner, because I didn't plan it, I didn't go after it, um, it just is what God did through me, through my husband, to bless the world. And we're just living our lives, our everyday lives. And one of those things, I'll just say this. Um, we were having our first trip to England, and it was through Andrew Womack Ministries. Dave and Andrew Womack ministered together for about 20 years, and we traveled with them like five weeks out of every year to different places in the world. And uh, uh, Andrew would bring the word, Dave would bring the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're landing in London, and Dave said to me, the Holy Spirit just said to me that we're going to be coming here many times. And guess how I took that at the time? I scoffed and inside. And I said, oh, sure. It took a miracle to get us here this time. How's this going to happen many times? <laughs> and do you know, we counted up after the years went by. We had been there over 50 times. So the Holy Spirit was right, and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but then there were other uh, adventures like that, that, for instance, we got a phone call, and these men said, we, there were three of us, and we were planning to go see Yasser Arafat. And for you young people, he was the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And he was a terrorist, <coughs> killed lots of people. And so, they were going to go and present a peace plan to him and the Palestinians and then go to the Knesset in Israel and present this same peace plan. The third man of their group, his wife had a dream at night and she felt that something bad would happen to him 
if he went. So he backed out, and they called Dave. And Dave said, well, let me ask my wife. And I said, go for it, Dave. My goodness, what an opportunity. You can be a tremendous blessing and impact the world. And would you have done that? <laughs> go for it? Well, that's how I did, because that's how we lived our lives. Amen. That's what it was all about. And by the way, whenever he was gone for lengths of time, I heard people in Tulsa, leaders there of the body of Christ, say, oh, poor so-and-so, his parents are so famous, and they're, it's just so hard on him. Oh, my goodness, what are you talking about? You know, making him into a victim when he's got this wonderful heritage and these great people, they were the Haggins that were his family, and uh, I thought I will never do that to my children. So I always told them, we are so privileged that your daddy is out there for weeks at a time telling people about Jesus around the world. And they never got the victim mentality or resented that he was, was gone. So I said, yes, Dave, go do this. So he prepared to do it. And you know, at that time, we had faxes that uh, people would send notes to you on. We didn't have cell phones and text and that kind of email. We might have had email, but anyway, they were sending faxes to him. How dare you go and meet with this terrorist? These were Christians. And uh, we just thought, you mean a terrorist doesn't need Jesus? And so, that reminds me, when we started our church, we had a group of people when we started in Denver, and they came to us, and they were very serious, and they said, we're going to really help in this church, and we have decided who the witches are in this church. And they named a few strong women. And so we decided, sorry, we're not accepting that. And I thought, don't witches need Jesus? Why should we be afraid of them? We've got the power. <laughs> it's all fake. Well, it's not really. You know, the devil has some power. But we have the authority, let's put it that way. We can stand against him. So don't be afraid of that kind of thing. And he went, the three men, and they got to Tunis, Tunisia. And there were guards with machine guns everywhere, guarding Arafat and his men. And Dave was just praying. He said, oh, God, don't let the Israelis strike tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and they met at night, by the way. And so uh, they, Arafat had gathered all his leaders and they presented the peace plan, the two other men, it was a father and son. And then they said, Dave, tell Arafat what you do. And so he stood up and he said, I bring the miracles of God to people. And he said, and, and Chairman Arafat, that's what they called him, Chairman Arafat, your legs are short and you have back problems and God wants to lengthen one of your legs. And he said afterwards, I should have said both of his legs because he was a very short man. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so he got down, he prayed for Arafat, he fell in the chair, he lengthened his legs, and he jumped up and he said, because he had back problems, he said, I'm healed, I'm healed. And he said, I command you to go to every office in my complex here tomorrow morning and pray for everybody and pray for miracles for them. And Dave did that. He got someone born again. One of the worst terrorists was born again. He saw in the Jerusalem news or in our newspaper after they returned a year or so that they had allowed him back into Israel, that man, and uh, they just had a great time. And Dave 
Arab that, a New Testament. And I know other people have been there and had witness to him and so forth. But this is just what God does. You know, how could we plan that? Not possible to do. Then they went to the Knesset in Israel and did the same thing. That opened doors for us later to go for a week and into Bethlehem, which is Palestinian, and teach in a Christian Arab Bible school for a week. And uh, just amazing experiences that way. Uh, we had divine appointments. There was an Arab girl in that school. She wanted us to come to her house, and we had failed to get her information. So a little later that day, we were in a traffic jam. Traffic was totally stopped. And we looked over to the other lane going that way. We're going this way. And there she was in the traffic jam over there, stopped right next to us. And we were able to get her information, go to her house, be a blessing to her and her family. Another time, Dave was coming back from Hong Kong, and the man sitting by him was a Jewish man from Haifa. And he, he, when he got to, I was there too, actually. And when we got to the LA airport, Dave prayed for him because he had a bad back and uh, sat him down, lengthened his legs, and then he said, come visit me if you're ever in Israel. So we had some numbers, and we wanted to visit. There were no cell phones. They had phones along the highway in Israel. They were all broken. By the way, just speak to this equation, and if you have uh, finances that you want to pay to get new equipment here. It's hard to hear them say. It, it's like it's bandaged up, and they're just hoping it will work another Sunday. So I encourage you to consider having a fund for that and get new equipment that you need here. To get this message to the world, just think what God's given us today that we can do this here, and it can go throughout the entire world. Amen. It's just amazing. Don't ever poo-poo technology. It's wonderful yeah. that we have this. Amen. For this day and age, for God's purposes. So we went to Haifa. We tried calling this phone dead, this phone dead, and, and we didn't know how to get to this man's house. So we stopped at another phone, and it was dead. And this woman came walking with her dog, and she said, may I help you? She said this in English. And we said, yeah, we're looking for this address. Can you direct us? She said, that's my house. That's where I live. And it was her husband on the airplane. And this is how God does it for you then. Right. He just he directs things that you could never do. And so, you just, oh, thank you, God. We went to his home. We had a meal with them. Got people born again in his home. Uh, then I'm thinking about the time that we took a team to Russia before the Soviet Union was gone, before the walls came down. And we had a whole busload a lot of pastors, and uh, it was an exciting time to be in that country where people hadn't smiled for 75 years. <laughs> and then Dave comes, <laughs> and we just had such a good time. But the pastors that were with us, Dave would come at midnight. Well, that bus was late, and we should have gone sooner, and they don't know what they're doing. Well, yeah, they didn't know. They hadn't had opportunity to do things like hire a bus and, and take a team and all of this. So of that tour, ask somebody who cares tour. Because <laughs> he was tired of talking to these disgruntled pastors because everything wasn't going as smoothly as they thought it should. But when we came, we came through Finland, 
because you could go on a vodka tour on a boat and go into Estonia, and the Finns would go there to get cheap vodka. And so they would let them in. Well, we had boxes of Christian literature, good news stuff, and some of it translated, some in that we wanted to get in through the customs. And we're wondering, how is this going to happen? All right, we get off the boat. We get into the custom area with all our stuff. And all of a sudden, all of the customs officials disappeared. There was a and I said to Wayne, who was with me, Wayne, get the boxes of literature. Get it on those dollies. We're going to go right through now while no one's watching. And we did that. No one watching. How did that ever happen? It just was a God thing. He wanted that literature in the country of the former Soviet Union. And we traveled all over. One time we had a team of 70 teen mania kids and other people. We traveled to Novosibirsk, which is in Mongolia, near Mongolia anyway, many uh, time zones. And we didn't know when it was coming or anything like that. And uh, uh, Dave said to a, a flight attendant, is this Novosibirsk? We had landed, and she, she didn't to know. Finally, another man on the plane got up and he said, Novosibirsk, Novosibirsk. So we got our team and got off. And uh, it was in the little shanty airport. We had our luggage and stuff. We stayed in a hotel. It was in the summer, and it was so hot. And you could open the window. This no AC. But the Team Mania teens were out on the street doing dramas, drawing people. We had just planted a church in another part of Russia, in Latvia. So they were coming here to Novosibirsk to plant a church. We had planted a bar there before. They were planting a church in Novosibirsk. So we're walking on the streets, passing out literature and so forth, and someone met another person whose brother played in the orchestra at the Moscow Circus, which was a permanent building in Novosibirsk, invited us to come free on Sunday morning for the circus. And we were planning the church that afternoon. So we all went there, and they asked Dave to be in the ring with the animals and the ringleader as they announced the circus. And here comes Dave, just marching in with his Bible, because he was from the USA, and that's what they were proud of. And he said, I'm not representing the USA today. I am representing God. I am representing heaven. And he read John 3.16, and the interpreter interpreted it, and he said things. And then he said, how many of you here want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning? And there were about 2,500 people in the circus place and hands went up all over the place and then we said and we're starting a church this afternoon at such and such and lots of people were there amazing. lots yeah <laughs> amazing did we plan that no but the holy spirit did yeah, yeah. so you follow jesus and you experience the extraordinary in Latvia one time, in the church, they brought, uh, have you heard of Rick Renner? All right. Dave convinced him to give his tapes to missionaries in the U.S. and then convinced him to go with him for his first trip out of the country, which was to Latvia. When he got off the airplane, he knelt on the ground and kissed the ground, and he said, we're moving here. He knew by the power of the Holy Spirit. They have lived there now over 30 years with their family, raised their family. Their three sons have all married uh, Russian women, and they have ministered just tremendously, taught the word of God throughout their country. And it's, so they were, uh, 
they had started a church by this time in Latvia, Riga, Latvia. And so many got born again that day, and they said, well, meet us down by the river. We'll have a baptism afterwards. And the river banks are filled with people. And he said, all those who want to get water baptized, and there were different men standing out there in the water. And Dave was one of them and other of our kids. And, you know, they had no robes or anything. Women just pulled off their dresses and, and uh, guys and they walked into the water, and, and, and the men from the U.S. are going, <laughs> but they baptized them in water. Just great experiences. It was, it was wonderful to see that happen. Um, okay, this one. We were on a TV program in Los Angeles. It was about marriage, and... Then afterwards, the couple leading that pro had made plans for dinner for the six of us because they invited Pat and Shirley Boone. And Pat Boone is a singer. He's known for his white shoes, right? And his wife went to heaven just recently. But very famous people in the industry in Hollywood. They lived right across from the Hollywood Hotel, and we picked them up there and went in their house. And Pat came in from the backyard where he had been shooting rats off of the fence in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you live in climates, you get different uh, situations like that. Like, you probably have cockroaches here. <laughs> Colorado. No cockroaches. Too cold. <laughs> so there are benefits to every climate. But we're sitting in the restaurant just sharing the goodness of God with each other and the miracles we had seen. And Dave was telling how he went to Canada, his first miracle meeting, and a lady got healed of multiple sclerosis. And she, her blind eyes opened, and she was on crutches. She jumped up, ran home, got her husband, brought him back, and things like that. That was in Canada, and he's sharing that. And pretty soon, this man comes around the corner of the restaurant, pushing a wheelchair. And he said, my wife and I have been listening to your conversation, and she has multiple sclerosis. Could you pray for her? So we all prayed for her, and I don't know what happened. It was just that. But I can believe God healed her when they got home. She was healed. But wow, talk about extraordinary living and exciting living that way. And then Robert Tom, I was talking with the young man in the back row there, and he said, I hear you know Robert Tom. He was a prophet from South Africa. He wrote a book called The New Wine is Better, and somehow we got a hold of it. And it was life-changing, and it's Tom, T-H-O-M. And uh, my husband gave it to his nephew, who had just left Campus Crusade and lived in a, an, an eastern town in Colorado, a small town. He wrote that book, and he said, on a Sunday night, God, I would like to meet a man like this someday. And so the next day, his friend from Oklahoma City, where they had been in Campus Crusade together, called and said, Harvey, guess what happened last night? I was sitting in a Denny's restaurant, and this man came over to me, and he said, Excuse Excuse me, do you know if there's a Ray Colorado? And the man said, why, yes, my friend just moved back there. Why do you ask? He said, well, I was sitting in a booth over here, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go to Ray, Colorado as soon as possible. And he didn't even know there was one. And so my husband was assigned to pick him up at the airport and spend a week with Robert Tom in Ray, Colorado. And what is your name? Gary. Gary had worked for Robert Tom and his son, Drummond. And so Dave got to be with him, and Dave always felt he 
who was going to receive anointing from anybody he was around who had gifts. So he was always having them lay hands on his head as they drove or lay hands on him wherever they were. And so that's what happened with Dave. And then Dave brought him to Greeley. And we were in the Presbyterian Church, and the pastor allowed us to use it the first night. The next morning he said, Dave, we can't do this again. I'm going to lose my church. <laughs> so they went to the Holiday Inn, and, and Robert Tom preached, and it was the World Series, and Dave said, I love baseball. He said, I love baseball, and you know, as he preached, he gave the scores to the World Series inning by inning, and he didn't have microphones in his ears. <laughs> the Holy Spirit told him the scores, and it was the time that uh, a guy whose name started with a D, I think, he hit so many home runs, it broke the record. If you know baseball, you, you maybe know who that was. I don't. So, um, but, but all these kinds of things happened, and it was then that Dave knew he was to start a Bible study. Started a Bible study. The house it met in was packed out soon, in a few months, and they had to find a different venue. And at, that was at the time when, and I didn't go to the Bible studies, by the way. I knew they were doing strange things like speaking out loud in tongues, lengthening legs. No, not for me. And um, Dave was very gracious. He went to the barn, he said, and he said, God, you made that woman. You'll have to change her, <laughs> change her heart. And God did that. He took us away to a Bible school for six weeks. And it was there at that school that I was praying for him once. Miracles happened, though. Businessmen called us. And Dave had said to me, you know, I think this Bible study is leading to a church. And I said, what do you mean? Like a church that meets on Sunday? He said, yes. And I said, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in Besides, who would be the pastor? <laughs> so at that school, because businessmen not only gave us a brand new yellow Cadillac to go to Bible school in, someone else paid for our Bible school. And then uh, Dave, Dave was teaching that Bible study, and they said, we're flying you home every week to teach the Bible study, and then you'll fly back from Greeley to Denver to Dallas, you can fly back to your school and continue on. He'd get back at 4 a.m. and never missed a class. And that's why I was praying for him, and the Holy Spirit said, I brought you here just for you so that you can see that I can flow through your husband or anyone else who's willing and available to reach the world. Amen. Oh, my goodness. And that was the beginning of Faith Ministries and reaching the world for the past 40 years. So God does it. Yes. And you just say, here am I, Lord. Hallelujah. Flow through me. Yes. You know what? I don't think he uses us because then we'd be puppets. <laughs> but he lives in us and he flows, flows through, through us. us. Yeah. So, hallelujah. So I would like you to stand for